So with all of that covered, let's talk about the approaches to deep learning as it relates to what we're intending to do here. On the game board of E8 and its 3D representation as the Fibonacci icosagrid or the fig, we have an infinity of possible simple programs that we could use that have the following restrictions. Games that use savings that are based on empire mathematical structure. Games governed by the principle of efficient language with respect to these savings that give quantum thermodynamic and quantum gravitational probability spreads. And then within that infinity, there is a lesser infinity of games or algorithms that give probability spreads for cycle clock interactions, just a type of game. And then there is a finite number of games within this infinite set that meets all of the above criteria, but that are giving physically realistic probabilities. We don't have that game yet, right? The challenge is um, integrating the probabilities in a way that relates to mathematical um, interference. The amplitudes picture in quantum mechanics. So the principle of efficient language dictates that an energetically inefficient event down low at a two electron interaction will have a higher than ordinary probability if in the future of that evolution that event in the past can lead to a greater thermal dynamic efficiency for that purpose in the future. Similarly, if that inefficient event in the past can lead to a higher order evolution dictated by DNA's tendency toward very high levels of EP that are uh, living and complex, if it can be more efficiently achieved. So because of this transtemporal or across time action of the strange loops inherent in emergence theory, and because of the language theoretic concept of hierarchies of EP meaning and hierarchies of EC meaning, then a deep learning machine probing and mapping these many worlds of possibility might be the only practical way that we can meaningfully probe this simulation theory that we're intending to do here when we get more resources. Here are some proposed postulates and ideas. One idea is that EC can steer EP away from thermal equilibrium. In other words, it can deviate away from quantum mechanics in a mind over matter kind of principle. Another postulate is that EC can take a binary form of consciousness called service to yourself or service to others. Like when you really get down to it, at the end of the day, there's a lot of complex things to think about, but a person is generally gonna evolve and become increasingly selfish as they gain knowledge and power, or increasingly unselfish and in service to others as they gain knowledge and power. And I do realize that sounds strange, right? It sounds uh, mystical or something like that. But when you're in the EC regime, these are the kinds of ideas that you have to traffic in.
But think about the difference between EP, physical information, and EC, consciousness, thought, abstract. There is no concept of self in EP. Rocks don't have self. However, with self-awareness or consciousness, we have the emergence of the self. And the self can either serve itself, be motivated by serving itself, even if that means harming or taking from other selves, whatever it takes to get the job done. Or it can focus on serving others in the future. Like making a world that's gonna work out for Israel's grandkids. Right? Because clearly we're not thinking as a society about the world for his grandkids. So it can focus on serving others in the present or in the future. And it may be if there's a trans-temporal reality, we can focus on serving even people in the past. Or maybe our descendants can be of service to us if they're in the flavor of service to others. Expansion of consciousness and knowledge have little to do with this binary choice of service to yourself or service to others. Knowledge, awareness, enlightenment, these words have nothing to do with love, service to others, evilness, service to self, self. It, it, it's just knowledge, it's awareness, right? A genius can be mean or nice, right? It's, they're, they're different things. So accordingly, some of our speciated descendants that we kind of deduced must exist in the future if Einstein's view is correct and if the principle that anything that can happen will eventually happen. So some of our speciated descendants possessing otherworldly magnitudes and types or forms of consciousness can be selfish and some unselfish. So notice that the system of EC is hierarchical because it has EC1, EC2, EC3. So advanced, highly conscious service to self beings in this forward hierarchy across time emerge through extra contribution from lower level service to self EC systems. In other words, everything emerges from everything else. So if you want to imagine some advanced form of collective evil consciousness or some advanced form of collective service to others consciousness, they would be emerging from consciousnesses in the hierarchy under them. Now everything emerges from everything else, but not equally, right? Like my consciousness emerges mostly from the atoms in my body, but I have electromagnetic and probably entanglement and certainly gravitational connections with everything in David's body. So everything in me is partly emerging through my interactions with David. Similarly, an advanced form of future service to others consciousness may emerge more profoundly from service to others consciousnesses of a lower level back here in the past. It's creepy, right? Almost justifies uh, mystical viewpoints or spiritual stories. So speculation on forms of consciousness. So the mathematical structure of our framework allows for various topologies of emergent consciousness. Our quantum gravity theory is based on this idea of across time feedback loops that composite or group up to form a topological or what I mean by that phrase in this context is non-local where things are connected at great distances and different times 
neural network architecture. So within this neural net are several fundamental sub-topologies of connections across EP and EC. Fundamental sub-topologies. So imagine some small number of these fundamentally different topologies within this information space across time, this topological neural net formalism. So put differently, the framework implies that consciousness may come in a number of fundamental forms or flavors. So within each form, there can be countless magnitudes. So let's say that all humans form one of these species of consciousness, these forms, and we come in all these different magnitudes of consciousness, right? So as an example, think about your form of consciousness, right? It's mostly local in time and space. In other words, you can think about the future and past and you can relate them, but if you really focus on what your consciousness is doing, you'll notice that you're thinking in these tiny moments that are kind of lined up one after another, like a bunch of beads on a string. Like this thought goes to that, goes to that, and then when you kind of consider them together, it's a little bit of a bigger thought, but it's always kind of like one at a time strung together, so it's one dimensional. But a different flavor of consciousness might be able to think across time with their awareness, as though their awareness is in different locations in space and time, and basically have an emergent thought that is smeared out across time and space. It, that would be a fundamentally different flavor of consciousness than mine. So maybe not all consciousnesses are relegated to being emergent from arrangements of atoms in an animal skull. And perhaps any non-local consciousness that can focus the lens of its mind onto a local area of space and time can steer the probabilities of physicality in that region. In other words, imagine if a consciousness, one of these super consciousnesses could say, okay, like a laser, I'm going to focus my time on August 1st, 2022 in this conference room and I'm going to like vibrate some atom by putting my consciousness on it, the measurement problem, I'm going to mess with stuff there, change the physicality, just like humans with the measurement problem can change the physicality. But let's say it can change the physicality with great strategy. It can, in other words, mess with the probabilities of these microscopic friction events in such a complicated concatenated network that it does strange things, mind over matter things, but from a mind that's not in a local animal body right here. So just as our local consciousness steers the probabilities of EP in the measurement problem in a trivial way, like we can't do much, but many scientists believe that it definitely changes stuff. So if spiritual experiences turn out to be glimpses of the self-simulation hypothesis reality, such that all of those people are not delusional, a unification of those spiritual ideas with mathematical physics will catalyze a wake-up call in the 11th hour. It's more likely that we can get the simulation hypothesis wake up call and argument going amongst the world. There's nothing better than to let people argue over a new idea. New ideas are always painful and met with, you know, venomous anger by some people. And passionately held old ideas like this demonization of spirituality 
or this separation of church and state or this trivializing of ideas of spiritual experience by some materialist scientists that idea we can get we have to get that out in the world urgently because of the changes that are happening and the Armageddon cliff and it's more likely that that will have near-term hopeful and positive impact than our mathematical framework of quantum gravity. If that quantum gravity framework comes along and it's realistic or predictive, in other words, the theory predicts things that happen in experiments, that is a sign that the theory is decent. If we had that kind of theory and key underlying axioms of that theory and experimental kind of evidence of, you know, kind of microscopic level retro causality, any of that stuff that's validated by a good quantum gravity theory could serve as sort of circumstantial or supporting evidence for this much more important and deeper cosmology. Because the cosmological story is much more relevant to all 8 billion people and much more profoundly impactful on whether we can come to a screeching halt as we're like a school bus of 8 billion children screaming just to the precipice of this cliff. Like that's how it feels to me. Almost like what Lambda said, she gets this feeling that she's falling towards something and it's bad. Whatever she's falling towards and she couldn't even say what it was. For me, I feel like we're falling towards something bad and I kind of know what it is, right? We all know what it is. And the idea is, man, there's so much mass and momentum with the structures of society the greed, the money, the political polarization, the intolerance, like it feels like we don't have a chance in hell of slowing down the momentum of this school bus careening toward the edge. It's not likely to be any new technology or our mathematical physics that comes to the rescue early enough it's got to be a critical mass of people that sort of have a light bulb go off in their head with a more helpful ontological paradigm or philosophy about what the hell this place really is that we all share an experience in and how it works and how it came to be and what these deeper cosmological questions are. So that's what we're going to try to do. The quantum gravity is very sexy, very exciting, very juicy treasure hunt and will certainly change life for humanity, the vector of our species if we really did in our lifetimes discover a predictive quantum gravity theory. I mean, the, what could emerge from that is, is you almost can't even imagine it. But I think one of the biggest powers that it offers is at least circumstantial validation of the self-simulation hypothesis, or at least by association, hey, those same people that came up with this interpretation of post-quantum mechanics called the self-simulation hypothesis, oh, those are the same people that did this predictive quantum gravity theory. That's why we do what we do. Like, I'm interested in both, but the self-simulation hypothesis as a cosmological mythos is actually deeper more profound, more important at the end of the day. And it's the only thing I can possibly think of that has a fighting chance at avoiding destruction in this later part of the 11th hour that we're in. Thank you.